everybody and uh, welcome to this talk which is going to be the fourth in our series on our vision and the title I was given which came from the discussion that took place in all the groups was the Holy Spirit brings healing and transformation in the early one of the early discussions of the steering group I had something resembling a vision now, those of you who know me know that this sort of thing doesn't happen to me very often. And my vision was this. I had a picture of blocks, sort of, I guess, stone blocks on the floor, and a swirling spirit going in between them all. No idea what it meant, but I'll come back to it later. So we're searching for meaning of this phrase, the Holy Spirit brings healing and transformation. And I'd like to remind us of a few things. The first thing is that the Holy Spirit is not confined. It's not confined to the New Testament. There are lots of stories of the Spirit in the Old Testament. It's not confined to our bidding. It's not confined to our very limited imagination or to our timescales. And a reminder as well that the, whole, the Hebrew word for spirit is in the feminine. Also a reminder that we may recognise quite easily the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which were referred to by Nick in his sermon a couple of weeks ago. We may recognise the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, from Galatians chapter 5. But we are not engaged in a sort of bird-watching exercise, ticking off these lists. The Holy Spirit has no limits. I want to focus on the Holy Spirit as both comforter and disturber. And our two stories uh, exemplify each of these. So the first story in the Acts of the Apostles, this is the first recorded instance of Peter with his colleague John performing a miracle. This was the fulfillment of the Jewish history and the promises of Jesus, the and after, immediately after the sending of the Holy Spirit. Peter's speech after this tells us that it was done in the name of Jesus, as a witness to the signs and the wonders performed in Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter says that those who join this new movement and become followers of Christ can expect to participate in times of refreshment. I thought that was a really lovely phrase, the work of the Holy Spirit as times of refreshment, and participate in it, not just be on the receiving end. So this healing miracle was the first, as I said, recorded by the apostles, being performed by the apostles, and was not actually requested by the man. The refreshment he was seeking was food and drink, and it wasn't actually provided, but something much different, something much better. So the Holy Spirit was at work and within and around the newly powered apostles, providing comfort to the man and also to the many others who the man told, those who afterwards heard and saw what had happened the Holy Spirit working much wider and spreading out, giving transformation to others. So this story I saw as an example of the Holy Spirit as comforter. The story in John chapter 3 uh, is, slightly more is slightly different, is slightly uh, more ambiguous. Jesus' presence here is ambiguous and it's a slightly risque encounter. He has taken the decision to travel through Samaria and to embark on a conversation with the woman, both contrary to the expectations of the day. And he ruffles her in several ways. He knows her history, her history which may be slightly more complicated in Judaic customs than immediately appears to us, and there may be an element of victimhood. But what is noticeable is that she is much more open to the conversation with Jesus than was Nicodemus in the previous chapter. And by the time she leaves behind her vessel for the physical water, 
she has grasped something of the offer of living water from Jesus. She is changed, certainly, and healed in a less obvious way. And it may be quite a painful process for her. We know also in the story that follows about the very sceptical reaction of the disciples. And in her community, she would have struggled to make her story credible. But she was transformed in such a way that she became a true disciple and spread the word. People did believe her. And so the transformation of the Holy Spirit spreads out further. She may have found the initial experience discomforting. As she said, she knew something of the coming of the Messiah, but it was in the actual meeting of Jesus she had the experience of spirit and truth. So I'm going to go straight on now to the stories that I requested of our congregations. And a big thank you to those of you who contributed. Um, so I'm not going to give a huge amount of detail about these stories, certainly not the one about the banana. You can ask me later, some of you. Um, but it was really wonderful. The, the stories uh, seem to illustrate being open to the Holy Spirit, being intentional about it, but still being surprised. And remaining also that the Holy Spirit is not there at our beck and call. Uh, it's not a dial-up takeaway service. I think that's an easy trap for us to fall into in our consumer culture. We also need to remember, and I'm going back here now to Nick's talk a couple of weeks ago, that the gifts are for the building up. They're not just for our own personal little cosy place. They're for building up our community, our church, and wider. So what did people tell me about? Several of you have witnessed the healing of medical conditions uh, in the context of public worship coming up to the front, quite dramatic, uh, including someone discarding a wheelchair. But also the experience of being healed while staying in your place, not coming up to the front and feeling the warmth in that part of your body that was suffering. There was also an example of healing by the intentional act of prayer by a group of friends. Possibly not all of them signed up Christians. Does God need a contract before he's willing to work through his Holy Spirit? I suspect that all of those friends were changed in some way by that experience. I've often heard people say that they have got through difficult times riding on the wave of prayer that they know is happening around them and for which they may not have the strength personally to do, a sort of vicarious blessing of the Holy Spirit. And that same inspiration has led to the prayer wave idea currently infusing the, our congregations. I'm going to add a little note of caution here. Uh, I, it's not by any means that I don't believe healing can and does happen. It does, and I've, I've known of it. I have slight skepticism about the big rally. Um, I think there's too much space for ego and hype. I'm aware of quite subtle psychological processes that can go on. One of you spoke about the Holy Spirit's role in moving from mind to heart. We may appreciate many things about God in principle, but actually experiencing them is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, I have an example of this from my own experience when I was quite young. A group of us in the sixth form would meet for prayers. We'd meet in the dark room of the physics lab at the school. I can't remember the story why, why that happened to be. And one particular friend was absolutely desperate to be able to speak in tongues. So week after week, we prayed for this. And then she did. One day, in the quiet and still and dark of the dark room of the physics lab, she spoke in tongues. This was a source of enormous comfort to her. Uh, for the rest of us, I think we were a bit bemused. And of course, we didn't have anybody there to interpret it. So we would had no idea what the meaning of it was. Another person spoke of the idea of 
realising that they needed to forgive somebody or something, but finding it really hard to do so by the force of sheer willpower. And it needed the Holy Spirit to break down their resistance and bring things to fruition. Another example given was that of being spared, a God chance moment of selecting one place to go over another and thus avoiding a mass shooting. These God coincidences do happen, but God of course is not our lucky charm. We cannot always avoid difficulties, illness and personal trauma. Another person mentioned the blessing we have in the words of our Bible, the way the Holy Spirit has inspired the writers and opens our ears and eyes as readers. And a couple of people mentioned the Psalms as a particular source of guidance and blessing, just as the Psalmists took absolutely everything to God in prayer, so can we for comfort. The matter of being open, I think, is critical. I had one example of the Holy Spirit giving a sense of unease, nudging and questioning, and that led to an examination of the heart and behaviour. And similarly, from someone I regard as a big prayer warrior, a nudging towards someone who needed prayer to be offered, but may not have been able to articulate it themselves. And lastly, a really common but quiet blessing of the Holy Spirit that happens to many, and this is, again, I can certainly relate to this, to many people when they're simply in a quiet space, maybe actively praying or meditating or daydreaming or not, when we can be overcome by the sudden drenching in warmth and excitement and reassurance of God's love, unannounced and spontaneous, just there to be enjoyed. So that gives you a range of the stories and experiences that people wrote and told me about. And these stories are really worth sharing with each other. They give comfort or possibly sometimes holy discomfort. They can offer inspiration and guidance. They give testimony, both by the telling, but also by the glow of the Holy Spirit on the face of the teller. As I assumed happened to the Samaritan woman at the well when she went back to tell her friends and the healed man who leapt and rejoiced. The transformation spread out. So how does this relate to our moving forward, our vision, our vision of God's work in this place? We must not lose sight of the fact that the Holy Spirit is God and is out there, is swirling around in the world and isn't just something for us to summon or control. The Holy Spirit is portrayed as wind and fire for a reason. Re reassurance of the power, not for us to harness, but for us to follow. We need to discern where it blows as a community and as a world. Let's be alert to its movement in our hearts, but let's also think big. Where is the Holy Spirit already working in our community, in our country and in our world? And what about my picture of the blocks and the swirling of the Holy Spirit? Well, nothing very dramatic, but each time my mind returns to the image, the blocks seem slightly smaller or slightly less well-defined, and the swirling spirit is taking up much more space. Now, I haven't analysed it any more than that, uh, and whether the blocks, and that was the word I was given, are us as individuals or churches or it's just a metaphor. And I'm not sure that it really matters because the focus should be on that enlarging and swirling of the Holy Spirit. So we've heard how the Holy Spirit comes to us in a variety of forms and at different times. And sometimes isn't apparent for long periods. Do not be disheartened, my sisters and brothers. Ask others to pray for you. We've heard how the Holy Spirit can be quiet or loud and powerful, can bring comfort or discomfort, 
we must remain open and intentional, and we will be changed. There will be transformation through joy. Sorry, I'm not going to leap or dance. I know one or two of you asked, have asked me to. Uh, but it can bring transformation through suffering. Keep telling the stories. It encourages and helps discernment. But beware the narrow narrative, narrow expectations of what will happen and how, because to be sure, God has bigger plans. And we must trust in God, whatever lies ahead, and working together as a benefice. I'm just going to read through the questions which are going to be put out for the groups to discuss, and then I'll finish with a word of prayer. So the first question is, how can we continue to see and encourage the Holy Spirit working in each one of us? And the second is, how can we see the Holy Spirit swirling around in our benefice, building us up into a spiritual dwelling for God? The third, how can we respond to the Holy Spirit active and powerful within the wider community and our world? And I think that's particularly important at the minute as we approach Christmas as people are getting quite low during this second period of, of lockdown. There are things going on, there are initiatives. And then question four, in the regular groups, but in other ways too, can we please keep telling these stories of the Holy Spirit for comfort and discomfort, to give thanks, also to test those spirits and to encourage each other. Uh, leaping, singing and dancing are permitted. The prayer that I'm going to finish with uh, is one that was uh, in common worship on Monday, which was when I sat down to start putting pen to paper. Uh, and I didn't in any way con confer with our musicians because the, uh, it's about purifying our hearts, which is going to be the song in a moment. So this is the prayer. Merciful God, purify our hearts in the flame of your spirit and transform our toil into an offering of praise that we may reject the proud rule of might and trust in Christ alone, for he is our Lord forever and ever.